Good morning. Okay, today is the 8th. I will harden Pharaoh's heart that he shall not let the people go. Exodus 4.21 There are several instances within the book of Exodus and also later in the Old Testament where reference is made to God hardening an individual's heart. An understanding of the doctrine of moral agency, the plan of salvation, and our Father's eagerness to save as many of his children as will be saved shows us that such an idea is foreign to the truth. Oh, I feel like I'm going to sneeze. God does not tempt his children, nor does he harden their hearts. The Joseph Smith translation of Exodus 4.21 helps us understand that people harden their own hearts, and when they refuse to repent, God permits them to continue in their sinful, habituated course to reap reap the consequences so there you go you never say god made me do it okay so today is genesis 13 verses 7 through the end of the chapter to chapter 14 verse 14 so <sighs> It's Genesis 13, verses 7 through 18, and chapter 14, verses 1 through 14. And in these verses, uh, the last half of chapter 13, Lot and Abram, their herdsmen get into a, a squabble about land or something. And Abraham says, let's not fight, okay? You're my nephew. We're kindred. You know, you pick which side of the land you there's plenty of land for both of us you pick which side you want and i'll go that way okay if you want the left i'll take the right you want the right i'll take the left so lot chooses this plentiful land that looks like the garden of the lord it says and then he pitches his tent towards sodom and abraham goes and dwells in canaan and then the lord says to him lift up your eyes I will give you all this land and your seed shall be numbered as the dust of the earth and so it kind of uh, sounded to me like abraham was like okay i knew he was gonna pick the better ground now i'm here in the land of canaan basically a desert but the lord says be of good cheer i gotcha then in verse in chapter 14 there's a war between a lot of kings with a lot of really weird names from a lot of lands with a lot of weird names and uh, Sodom and Gomorrah fall and Lot is taken prisoner by these other people and one of his servants escapes and goes and tells Abram that Lot has been taken and so Abram gathers up his household this is like 300 and something and they go and they're gonna go get lot so that's what happens in these verses so uh, avoiding worldliness we are to exercise extreme caution while living in the world not to partake of worldly practices let us be cautious not to overlook the subtle inference of Lot pitching his tent towards Sodom. Sodom was a city of sin. We should abhor sin and stay away and avoid the road to sin. Having pitched his tent towards Sodom, it wasn't long before Lot lived in Sodom. As is often the case when people ripen in iniquity, the result was war and bloodshed. Caught up, Lot lost it all. Abraham came to his rescue and saved lot as well as his family friends and goods we must not be of the world for satan desires to sift us as wheat never assume you have the power to resist all temptation that's a good line never assume you have the power to resist all temptation you must stay on the straight and narrow for broad is the way that leads to destruction one little degree can change the course of a mighty ship over its course in a few days. 
So likewise can our lives be ruined with just a simple turn towards the world and Satan. Lot, meaning a covering, son of Haran, a nephew of Abraham, joined with the family entourage, leaving Ur of the Chaldees for the, their journey to the land of Canaan. The estates of Abraham and Lot were so abundant that the two families, <clears throat> two family groups had to be separated to find terrain of sufficient size for both. When Abraham granted Lot a choice of where he should reside, Lot favored the verdant plains and pitched his tent towards Sodom. That location exposed Lot to the battle that rocked the area in due time. Lot and his family dwelt by choice in a wicked city. Thus, messengers were sent to warn Lot to remove his family from the midst of evil, lest they should be present when the impending destruction from heaven should take place. Then, when Lot seemed to resist, the messengers took forceful action. The escape was just in time. We can look back on the experience of Lot and remember to avoid following his example when he pitched his tent towards Sodom. We are counseled well to focus our view on eternal things rather than on the enticements of the world. We can also remember to avoid the experience of Lot's wife when she disobeyed the counsel of the messengers of God by looking back. At the same time, we can garner from... The story of Lot, the mercy and compassion of the Lord in taking steps to save Lot and his family from the fiery destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. That was good. I enjoyed that quite a bit. Um, and, well, we read them, so let's talk about them. So, uh, then it goes into the people or the places and the names that, uh, were talked about in verse in chapter 14. So uh Kedoleomer or Kedoleomer was a king of Elam in the time of Abraham. Elam was an ancient country lying in the southwest region of what is today Iran in league with three princes of Babylon. He defeated the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah and several other cities in the area of the land. In the battle, the victors took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and several prisoners, including Lot. Learning of his abduction, Abraham went out with 318 of his own men, rooted the forces of Kedoleomer, and regained all the goods as well as the prisoners. And then Ref... Ref... I am Rephaim, meaning giants, uh, were the pre-Israelite people who were especially large in stature. At the time of Abraham, Kedoleomer defeated this tribe and several others. According to the covenant promise given by the Lord to Abraham and his seed, the Rephaim, Rephaim and other indigenous peoples were to be supplanted and subjected to by the Israelites. And then Amalekites were the ancient Arab tribe that existed at the time of Abraham and continued on to the time of Moses and beyond. The Amalekites were constantly at war with the Hebrews in connection with the Exodus and the return of the Holy Land. The power of the Amalekites was eventually broken by Saul and David. The Simeonites later eradicated the last vestige of the Amalekites. The Amalekites do not derive their name from Amalek, grandson of Esau, who lived much later. Uh, and then Abraham was identified as a Hebrew, as was Joseph in Egypt and all of the Israelites during their sojourn in the country. The deriv deriv derivation, I can't say that word, of the word Hebrew may relate to the word Eber to cross or to as to go on as to go the other side of a river, implying that Abraham and his seed were those who had come from the other side of the river, the Euphrates. Alternatively, the word Hebrew may derive from the name Eber or Heber, 
one of the ancestors of Abraham. In general, the word Hebrews has come to refer to the whole house of Israel, including the Jews in modern times. And last one, Mamre was an Amorite ally of Abraham in Canaan. He was among the 318 men Abraham used to rout the forces of Ketoleomer. The name Mamre was also used to signify the place where Abraham settled when he first came to Canaan and separated his estate from Lot. It was there that Abraham acquired property for the burial place for his family and where many notable ones were buried, including Sarah, Abraham, Isaac, Rebecca, Leah, and Jacob. So there's a lot of information about all that stuff, but I suppose, like, you gotta know your history. <sighs> Alright, that was a lot of reading, I know. And I can't pronounce any of the words, like, at all. But that was Genesis 13, verses 7 through Genesis 14, 14. And we'll see you tomorrow.